Oh, welcome. I, I couldn't see before. How many of you were here yesterday? Okay, so um, we're going to continue our look at Francis Coppola. Um, when, you, when you hear a sentence and you have the word um, house in the sentence, you really don't know what that means. You know what the word means, but you don't know what it means in a sentence. If I say to you, I have a beautiful split-level blue house, then you know. Film is the same way. If you just see one film of a director, you really don't know the personality, the consistent personality that great directors bring to film. Now, as, as an auteurist, as we talked a little bit about last night, we, uh, that, uh, auteurism is a critical device. It's not a filmmaking device. And we use it just as a way to organize our thinking and ranking directors, not as a competition, but to give the ones who deserve to be at the top, we give them that acknowledgement. We call it the Pantheon. Um, Francis Ford Coppola is in the Pantheon. Uh, he didn't make that many films. He just kind of edged in. But his films are so wonderful that um, we, gave him, we gave him entry to uh, the Pantheon. Uh, he's an interesting filmmaker. If you saw the conversation last night, that is one of the best films that illustrates what we say. It's not the story. It's the way you tell the story. That is the whole key to understanding what art is. So, uh, Francis Coppola went to UCLA, graduate school in film, um, and there he met another young filmmaker, George Lucas, who was also completely unknown, and Jim Morrison from The Doors. And as you remember in Apocalypse Now, when the film opens, it has a Doors record. This is the end. Da, da, da. Um, so what Coppola does, he likes to form uh, a family. Uh, last night, you saw Bobby Duval as the, uh, the one who gets killed, and uh, John Cazale, and um, a couple of others are in all of these films. Fred Forrest is in um, Apocalypse Now. It's like a continuum of his family, of his creative family. Um, and that's one of the themes of his film. Even last night, the marriage, the family, the destruction, um, and, and the voyeurism that uh, we have as a privileged audience member. So while they're spying on the couple, we are, in a sense, spying on them. Um, Wonderful film. I hope people in the re-release get to see it. When Coppola graduated from uh, UCLA, he was broke. He had no money. Um, and so what everybody did in Hollywood, uh, except me, is he made, he made porno films, uh, softcore porn films, uh, uh, The Bellboy and The Playgirls, things like that just to make money. And um, oddly enough, a lot of, by the way, a lot of directors did that. Um, you, you just don't know about it because they don't want you to know about it. But it taught him how to make films and how to make films quickly with a low budget. He eventually got a job because of those films with Roger Corman the great uh, cultish film director who did all those Edgar Allan Poe films. Uh, you may not know him, but you know his films. And then uh, this film really begins uh, the making of in the 50s when Paramount started to go downhill, started to lose buckets of money and it was about to go bankrupt. They needed someone uh, to take over the studio uh, creatively. Gulf and Western had bought it. They didn't know how to make movies. 
They were just interested in making money. And this became a big liability for them. So they went down the list of people they wanted to run the studio. They couldn't find anybody because it was a suicidal, no-win job. They finally came to an actor, Bob Evans, who is such an interesting guy. He wound up heading the studio. And uh, he met this professor, I think at Princeton, Princeton or, or maybe Harvard, uh, who had an idea for a film. He said, well, I like that idea. Let's make it. So uh, um, I think Eric Siegel was his name. While he was writing the script, he also wrote it as a novel. Uh, he took, the novel took two weeks to write, and it was called Love Story. Evans bought the film mainly because he wanted his wife, Ali McGraw, to have a shot at stardom. She was a fashion model, very beautiful. Um, Love Story became the number one film of that year. And suddenly, Bob Evans was a force. He was able to do whatever he wanted. So they were having a conference trying to figure out what to do. And somebody said, well, what about a gangster film? You know, they were always great for Warner Brothers and all that. And he said, there have been 10 recent films about the mafia. None of them made money. It was a Kirk Douglas one. There were, there were a whole bunch of them. He said, why? And they, they figured out <laughs> that they weren't made by Italians. And uh, if you're going to make a film about the mafia, it's probably a good idea to have a little, or as Bob Evans said, you need to smell the spaghetti. Um, he got the okay to make the film after the novel came out by Mario Puzo in 1970. Um, I read it when it came out, and it was just enthralling. Um, Puzo was actually a literary writer who had done several novels before The Godfather, none of which sold anything, even less than my books. They, they did nothing. Um, and he needed money. The money is everything in uh, Hollywood, everything. Uh, and BMWs, the two things that are most important in Hollywood. Um, because you live in your car, you don't live at home. Um, Evans was a fan of Puzo. He said, let's, let's get a, a real mafia film based on your book. So they worked on it for over a year. And then the studio uh, demanded that Sergio Leone direct the film. You know Sergio Leone from the Clint Eastwood Westerns. And he was ready to go. Italian, European, everything perfect. And he then decided to pull out of this film. And he made his own uh, mob film. It was Made in America was the, the name of that film. Um, and I think De Niro was in it, matter of fact. So he was gone. Then they went to... Peter Bogdanovich, who just passed away, uh, a good friend of mine, he was all set to do it. And then he decided he wanted to make What's Up, Doc, with Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill, I think, uh, and left the film to do his own film. They couldn't find anybody to make this film. And I'll tell you why after, why nobody wanted to touch this film. They went through a list of directors. They got to the bottom of the list, and there was poor Francis Coppola, who had made two or three movies. Uh, it, you're a big boy now, uh, The Rain People, uh, and one or two others that didn't go anywhere. Good films, but nobody saw them. Um, and he said, well, this is the last guy on the list. This is Z in the alphabet. Um, should we offer it to him? The studio head said, the head of uh, Gulf and Western, absolutely not. So Evans got a hold of Sidney Korshak, who was uh, the mob representative in Hollywood. I'll tell you more about that later. He made a phone call. The next day, uh, Evans got a call saying, OK, hire him. Um, 
And it said, uh, get Ernest Borgnine to play the Godfather. Everybody looked at Ernest Borgnine? Uh, no. Um, and then they, they wanted, um, and this is the killer, they wanted Danny Thomas. I, I, I kid you not. They wanted Danny Thomas to play the Godfather for some reason. I think because uh, Danny Thomas played Vegas a lot. Vegas had a lot of mob connections in those days. Hollywood had a lot of mob connections. They wanted to, just like in this film, they, they wanted Danny Thomas to star in the film. Um, Bob Evans said no. Uh, he said to Coppola, who do you want in this film? Who would you choose? And he said, uh, I want Marlon Brando. And they said, we're not, Brando is poison in the industry. We don't want him. He's too crazy. He's too overweight. He's, he's not the Marlon Brando. He can't get work. I want Marlon Brando, or I'm, I'm going to join Sergio Leone in Italy. Um, they called Brando. They went back and forth. Brando wanted a million dollars. They wound up paying him, I think, $100,000. And his proviso was that you had to hire this kid he liked, Al Pacino. Now, Al Pacino, um, nobody wanted, uh, not even Francis uh, Coppola. Nobody, what they thought, if you read the book, Michael is a very different character than the Michael Corleone you see in this film. Um, but Brando insisted, um, got his way, poor Danny Thomas crying, um, and Pacino got in. And the whole idea was, um, uh, well, one of the reasons why Paramount didn't want Brando, another reason, because he wasn't Italian. And Evans had looked at all these previous Italian, uh, uh, mafia films, why they didn't work, because nobody was Italian in them. They were all directed by studio people. So the idea was to make a real Italian film about Italians. And so uh, Coppola was afraid to make this film because he was Italian, and he didn't want to denigrate his own people by making a mob film. So I'll tell you how he got around that uh, after. I want you to see it for yourself. So Pacino at the time was living in a cellar in uh, the west side of Manhattan, starving to death. James Kahn had been in an earlier Coppola film, I think it was The Rain People, um, Jewish. Uh, but he got in the film anyway. And John Cazale, Italian, there are a lot of Italians in this film. And again, it's like, you know, La Ma Familia. It's a family film. And that's what Coppola is uh, about, family. So I won't go any further. Um, after the film, I will tell you what I think this film is about and what happened to it when uh, they struggled to get this film finished. Enjoy it. Um, it's uh, Francis Ford Coppola is the godfather. And uh, please leave your weapons outside. We don't want anybody shooting at the screen. OK, enjoy it.